Γεια σα, είμαι ο Στέλιο Γιανακόπουλο και σήμερα βρισκόμαστε στο Μπόλτον, μια περιοχή η οποία βρίσκεται λίγο έξω από το Μάτσεστερ, όπου εγώ και η οικογένειά μου ζούμε τα τελευταία χρόνια. Θα κάνουμε μια περιήγηση, να σα δείξω λίγο το γήπεδο τη Μπόλτον, τα ποτητήρια και γενικότερα του χώρου στου οποίου βρισκόμουν κάθε μέρα με την ομάδα για τι προπονήσει και του αγώνε. Σίγουρα γύρω από αυτά τα σημεία τα οποία θα δείτε εγώ προσωπικά αλλά και ο Σαμ Αλλαρντάις περάσαμε πάρα πολύ όμορφες στιγμές έχουμε πάρα πολύ όμορφες αναμνήσεις από την κοινή μας πορεία στην Bolton Wanderers τα χρόνια που συνεργαστήκαμε τα οποία ήταν από το 2003 μέχρι το 2007 καταφέραμε και πήραμε δύο φορές ευρωπαϊκά ουστήριο για το Europa League και καταφέραμε και παίξαμε και σε ένα τελικό κυπέλο Αγγλίας στο Millennium του Cardiff το καλοκαίρι του 2003 με αντίπελο την Middlesbrough. Hello Gaffa. Thank you very much for uh, joining the show. It's a privilege for me to have one more conversation with you with amongst others. Obviously we both have uh, great memories uh, from the club in uh, the time we we spent together. For me personally you know that it's unbelievable moments European uh, qualifications final in the Carling Cup. Obviously, in my time uh, here, we, I managed with my national team to, to win the Euros, amongst other champions that you have brought here be before me. Yeah. And uh, I will never forget the, the day that I signed for the club in your office, by the way. You were on vacation. Yeah. And uh, the Secretary General of the club, uh, Mr. Simon Marland, he put me on the, on the phone with you and uh, You congratulated me for joining the club. It seems like yesterday to me, back in 2003. <laughs> well, it's a huge amount of time yeah. uh, that we have uh, seen passing since those uh, just great days. You know, I mean, um, you enjoyed yourself. I mean, that was based on me having so much love for this club. I think mean, that uh, your talents as a manager, integrate in terms integral in terms of your success at a club, but. When you love a club as much as I love this one, where it all started for me at 15, uh, then there is no way in my mind when I came here in 1999 that I was going to fail. And uh, uh, fortunately for me at that time, I was allowed to run football from top to bottom. And uh, that is no longer the case at nearly every football club now. And because I had that responsibility and because I love the club, Players like yourself were an integral part of the success and the joy that we brought to this magnificent stadium. And I think yeah. that um, um, this stadium is iconic. It doesn't get, perhaps like the team, it doesn't get the credit it deserves, but it's here. Uh, it's a fantastic landmark in Bolton and had some fantastic times. And uh, you have chose to still live here because you loved it that much. I've I'm a Midlander, but I lived here most of my life, and um, and that's the affection we both have for what was a, a wonderful time for both of us. Yeah, to be honest, um, not only for you in Bolton Wanderers, but uh, in your general career, so the people in Greece uh, can know as well. You have uh, managed uh, in the in the top flight in more than 1,000 games. You have more than 40% uh, winning games, which is an unbelievable record. Uh, For considerably the clubs that uh, you have worked for, what can anybody say about uh, your amazing career? And uh, you're still on the on the way to, on the way to go. On Maybe, the waiting list still. Yeah, waiting list. <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky enough to, to join the club in the beginning because it has already started 2002-2003. Mm -hmm. But I found myself very, very lucky to, to join the club, I think, in the modern time of the club, in the best uh, timing ever. Because together we achieved uh, so many things. For, for a club like Bolton to qualify twice in a top eight in the Premiership, uh, nobody would imagine. To... And it should have been higher. Should have been higher. It should have been Champions League, but you know, that might be something we talk about later. But I think yeah. that uh, I just want to 
just want to just to remind me how, uh, what, what was it like coming to the Premier League? Because, you know, people of high status and high calibre from other countries, how did you find it when you right. had to adjust? It was like a, it was like a personal bet for me to join, to, to try myself in the, in the most difficult uh, division in the world, the most competitive, the toughest, the most physical. That was a big bet that I have put with my, my own self. So uh, I wanted to, to prove wrong some uh, doubters and some other opinions that uh, they were back home in Greece that I couldn't make it. That was even bigger uh, motivation for me to prove them, to prove them wrong. So uh, this is the thinking behind my decision uh, joining the club. So would you say one of the biggest assets here was making you a part of the family? Oh, yes. We had this family culture that we we tried to bring yes didn't didn't um detract from the success we wanted to achieve but when i say family we're talking about not just the players but your own family that we tried to integrate into you know with sue with a player liaison officer and yes. massock in the way Know, just take us through your your time and you know what what it was because I felt it were good but I I, I initiated it from yourself you know obviously you already know you are experienced enough uh, to know that uh, all these things behind the scenes that you have created mm. all these backroom stuff the science the scouting uh, the coaching uh, the mentoring uh, that we had uh, it was ahead of the, of the of the times you, you were ahead of your time so uh, for a player coming from, from abroad and experiencing the warmth of a welcome that I witnessed, and not only myself, other players as well, it makes you feel more like home, makes you feel that you, come, you already came to a, to a new family that will hug you, that will uh, help you produce uh, without any problems outside of the pitch, no matter what. Everything uh, was already sorted before it happened, so it was already predicted what myself and the other players that joined the club after me uh, or even before me, there were no issues uh, whatsoever. The peace of mind of a player uh, of a high expectation, a high caliber, as you say, it's a, it's a must in order to perform on the pitch. One of the things that stands out for me, you know, not, not just you, the way you played on the pitch, I mean, you know, I think consistently the, it was fantastic, which is what the Premier League's all about. It wasn't just, you know, performances here and there it was a consistent level of of quality performances but when you won the euros in 2004 and i was watching i actually came to a couple of games but when i saw your interview with that big smile on your face and your son with the bought wondrous kit on said it all for me you know what i mean, I mean the semi-final this is the semi-final so semi yeah the semi-final so so that was a, like a a big moment for me that we well if he's got his son with the Bolt Wanderers kit on in the Euro Champions, we must be doing something right, you know. Right. So, uh, so it was, uh, you know, a great period for you, and um, and obviously, it was a big for the history of Bolt Wanderers to have somebody that, that had won the Euros playing for him, you know. Yeah. And uh, at this moment of uh, time, I'd like to highlight a coaching advice from you on the first game of the of the competition, the opening game of the competition, we play against Portugal. Yeah. And uh, if uh, you go home after and you see how we scored with the, the first goal, it's an advi advice from you. No, no disres disrespect to Mr. Ray Hagel, yeah. but uh, you know, some individual opinions and movements of the players that they manage themselves during the game, the coach cannot interfere with their decisions, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have took on board your orders uh, with the game plan that we had with Bolton Wanderers. Okay. So the ball goes to Paolo Ferreira on the right, and he wants to play with Luis Figo, which is right behind me, with Takis Fisas, which is our left back. So I saw him inside, which was yeah, yeah. your game plan, game plan here. Yeah. Yeah. 
So always inside where we are, our strength is and our numbers is. So I saw Paolo Ferreira inside and he makes a mistake. If I didn't show him inside, he would have passed the ball to Luis Figo and we go from there. Yeah. So he tries to play inside, he loses possession, Caragunis takes the ball, dribbles a little bit, shoots and we score the first in the opening goal of the tournament. There's a big difference between an experienced player and an old player. An old player just gets old and doesn't gather the information from his experience, whereas an experienced player uses experiences through the years to play on and on and on and use those experiences wherever he might go. And that's what you, as a coach, that's what you're looking for. So uh, obviously your gathering of information was, um, was pretty good at the time. So. <laughs> were you on vacation when we were playing in the, in the Euros? I went to see a few games. Right. It, so you managed to make vacation at the same time with... With both, with, yeah. I mean, I've travelled from Spain, where my, my villa was, and Ken just flew over and, and in watches, watches the games when I can, like you mean. So the only problem is, is, is leaving your family. Yeah. When you do, when you do manage it 24-7, your wife can get a little annoyed if you're saying, right, I'm leaving you here and I'm going to watch... The, the Euro, so yeah. I had to be a little careful about that. But I, I mean, obviously, watching and going watching the games, some of the games live was like was was pretty good, and then you're seeing players. But I think if we if we go back to your your uh, coach at the time, and um, I remember uh, being absolutely delighted that you'd won it, but the negativity outside of your country. And I don't know whether you, you got a glimpse of that or not by the coach being able to put that team together to become so resilient and yet be able to win these big football matches. I thought it was a great disrespect to, to you players and the coach for the way that he, he analysed the players he had available and you know put together this style of play these tactics to to play against uh, the opposition you're playing against and uh, and win win the cup win the tournament you know and I, and I thought that um, it was disrespectful outside of, uh, of of your country that the you know people were saying it's you know it's negative it's it's you know it's, it's as we have suffered in our time when you're here like you mean this is like, what was about you know, this, to... this perception of yeah. You know, how, how you should play or what you should do and yeah. how you should do it, which is, you yeah. know, something that's always has always been a, a bugbearer for me, you know what I mean? But, yeah. you know, one that you have to ignore and, and, exactly. and do what you have to do. And this is exactly where uh, it gels together with uh, the mentality of yours that uh, we used to, to manage to play here effective and winning football and not uh, tippy-tappy Charlie football that goes nowhere, just for the sake of it. And uh, this is exactly the mentality that Otto, Otto Rehagel had uh, with, this, with this team that we won the Euro. So he didn't want, want us to play a pretty tippy-tappy football and go nowhere. He wanted us to play an effective football and have winning mentality and a winning football. And this is exactly what we did. I still remember uh, when he told us uh, many, many times before the games, you go to the game, after the game, you go to the mirror when you are completely alone, you look yourself to the mirror and you know exactly if you have played well or not well. You know. You don't expect others to tell you you were good or yeah. you were bad. You know. So I want you, after the game, to go to the mirror, look at yourself and say, I gave everything. This is what I want. With these last orders, we were going out for a warm-up. So, what else motivation do you need? You play in a major tournament, the whole planet is watching, you represent your country, go out and, and enjoy. What else, if for, for, for example, if you were a manager, what else or what more could you say to the players of this calibre? Exactly the same, I mean, it's, it's exactly the same. I, I think that, um, I think that the, the challenge for you, and this didn't ha this didn't happen for you because I spoke to Alex Ferguson about this. I mean, we'd had a, our best season. You had your great season here, and, and obviously topped that off with the Euros. 
But Sir Alex always told me when he won the title, the biggest problem would be when the players came back that they didn't have the mentality to win it again. And you had to be careful as the manager to make sure that you, you got the players ready and you got the players effectively ready to do that. And you, you didn't seem to... The, the team didn't have a, a, any struggle progressing, but you didn't have any struggles either by the fact that you'd, you'd peaked in this massive high and you had to go again. And, and, you know, my opinion was that I would always be looking for complacency and, and ready to yeah. look at the stats, look at the physical output, look at your game, everybody's game. And it all used to tell me about whether you were, you were dropping off or not. So I could intervene, but that, that was a, you know, a, great, a great challenge for everybody is continuing to grow, and, which is what the team did. And, and I think that that's where we gave so many fans so much, so much joy because our progression continued. We come to the old Rafa Benitez intervention, of which was quite difficult for both of us at the particular time, like you mean. So you get a club like Liverpool wanting you, and then it's it's a very difficult, very difficult decision to turn. Could we share the story? We can share in, the story in, in, yeah, yeah. in your office. <laughs> yeah, you, you you take it from there, like you mean. But it was right. essential. It, it, it was essential, in my opinion, that the offer wasn't big enough to even consider letting you go. And Rafa Benitez thought he could pinch it for, was it two million? I think it two, might have been three. Um, and at that particular time... It was... Uh... It, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything that, that was anywhere near, in my opinion. And I had to convince the chairman of Bolton Wonders about that, by the way. So we can tell uh, a little... Uh, uh story behind the scenes that uh, took place uh, back then. Uh, I still remember, uh, of course, the, in the big interest because Rafa Benitez was calling me yeah. in a period of uh, 10 days, every single day before the training, to tell me, be careful in the training, <laughs> because after the training, we want to send the offer to the club. So after the training, he was calling me again to see if I was not injured in the training. <laughs> I remember the... The moment, it was the day before we travelled to West Ham, Friday, Friday morning, the last training, after we were going to catch up the train from Preston to go back to, to go to London, that you, you put me in your office, you locked the door and you told me, if you don't renew the, your contract, you're not getting out for, for training. That's right. So... Um, that was good management then. That was a good man-to-man -man <laughs> management. Hey, you got, did you get a good rise though? Yeah. You did get a good contract? Yeah. I did, I did get a good contract. You were very hard in the duration of the contract, but uh, eventually I convinced you to sign for three years instead of you, of two, that you wanted. No. And uh, I still remember the conversation that uh, we had it that particular day in your office. It was a very honest conversation, uh, besides all the humor that uh, we were saying. I remember telling you that uh, if you were in my position, and Liverpool wanted you. Absolutely. You wouldn't want to leave and join yeah. one of the biggest club in the Absolutely, world. Absolutely, yeah. Wear this, uh, this shirt. Of course, you, you said that's a very big temptation. But eventually we had a very, very honest conversation and uh, you convinced me with your dream about the club, with the next step that we could make in the club because we were already uh, qualified for, the, for Europe mm. uh, to push on for the Champions League position. So. Uh, that was my best, uh, my, my next motivation uh, with me in the club. That's why I renewed my contract for three more years. We are in the team of the team. 
και αυτή συγκεκριμένα η θέση που κάθομαι αυτή τη στιγμή είναι η θέση που καθόμουν όταν αγωνιζόμουν στην ομάδα. Φυσικά υπάρχουν πάρα πολύ ωραίες στιγμές, πολύ ωραίες αναμνήσεις, τις οποίες κρατάω πολύ βαθιά μέσα στην καρδιά μου. Σίγουρα υπάρχουν και κάποιες δυσάρεστες, αλλά στην εποχή μάλλον την οποία αγωνίστηκα, οι ευχάριστες στιγμές ήταν πολύ περισσότερες από τι δυσάρεστες. I would like to ask you uh, something else. Uh, I want you to think back uh, your fantastic career all over the years and uh, think, except me, which are the, the best uh, three or four players that you have, uh, you have managed and why? Top three, maybe. Top three, I think that, um, that there, are, there are some... I, I, I'm just going to stick... I'm just going to stick... There are some players, good players, that, that have managed outside this club. You know, like Wayne Rooney, and but obviously Wayne was coming to the end of his career. Wilfred Zaha, you know, at, uh, at Crystal Palace, who's has always been shining, but nobody's taken the chance, and that's a shame for him. I think, like you mean, but he he, he was a special talent. But in this in this era, we had world class. Yes. So we got JJ Acocha. Not only as a player, but as a captain. I'm sure you'd agree with that at yep. the time. For me, there was one player that came here just for a short period of time that just blew me away. I know. I was, know the name. Which was Fernando Hierro. And I spent more time on trying to persuade him to stay another year stay, yeah. than, than I'd spent on anybody. But, you know, he, he was... Very, very good in his, in his. Not when he first came. I mean, it, he was one of the players that struggled more than anybody else. Maybe because he was 34, the pace of the game took him a while before his brain took over. On another note, I'd like to ask you about which are the players that uh, they were more difficult to play against? To manage or play against? Uh, and play against and manage. Both. Well, there's. Well, the, the teams we played against were top boys, were always difficult, but we always found a way to, as the seasons went on, not only be able to contain them, but also be able to create more against them. Yeah. And that was a, you know, this, this thing about we're, we're playing this style that other managers had cre tried to, you know, create against us to, to knock us down which was taken up by some of the media, was something we should have knocked down more, certainly me, but certainly you as players as well. Because as the time, as these players got better and better, and Gary Speeds, Kevin Nolan emerging, you know, Nick, Nicky Hunt, you know, Staly, uh, Tao Benayim, Abdul Amiti, Ricardo Gardner, Yussi in goal, you know, this team was a squad of, of hugely talented players that had won more than 20 trophies across Europe, World Cup, European Championship, Champions League. And, and I just said, don't just come here and see you. Don't just come here and see out your career. Come here and achieve something. It won't win. It might not be winning the league, it might, you know, but it will be qualifying for Europe, getting to a cup final, maybe winning it. So, and I think everybody took that up on, on board, like, you know, but the, The, the fact of uh, play, playing mind games with managers was a great thing for me. We take uh, um, a lot of joy out of the fact that we, we achieved what we wanted to achieve. And my, my ultimate regret is, is having to leave. Um, you know, that's another story. That's nothing to do with you. That's to do with the, uh, me and the board, unfortunately. So I think that uh, uh, we got to a fantastic place and we continue to get to a fantastic place. When you got to get to Champions League, we were geared up for it. We were ready. We I were, believe we, so. We were, we were ready for it, and I wanted, if we want to get to that level, we wanted it to happen. We were third in the league. And pushing? 2006-2007, and we're way, way positioned in a great place to finish at least fourth. But the squad needed some help. The squad needed a couple of players that 
you know, we were we had a couple of injuries and those players were ready, but the chairman didn't put the money in to buy them. Yeah. And that was the that was the biggest the biggest personal heartbreak for me. Mm. But my head said, This is not right for you, Sam, anymore. So I had to let the head take control. Um, and not the heart. And not the heart. I think I think I probably would have ended up like Sean Dyish at Burnley Football Club. We brought that much success to this club yeah. that because the, the directors didn't want to go to, that was the word, we don't want to go to the Champions League. You lads didn't know that. I mean, imagine if in January I'd have come to you and said, by the way, lads, the chairman says we don't want to go to the Champions League. What would have happened? Believe me, if you came in the dressing room telling us that, yeah. We're all together collectively. We're going to pay a visit to the chairman. I know. So, so he will have a big, big problem. That, yeah. But that's, <laughs> a, it, it, that's, a, that's the sad tale at the end of what was a great time. But, you know, that's football, as we say, and, yeah. and move on. But, you know, we're still, you know, we're still looking the past. And as we get older and as time goes on, you know, um, we enjoy those moments that we still oh, yes. try and achieve in some way in life. Not for me... In, in, in management, but in life now. How do you see, coaching-wise or as a spectator, how do you see the Premiership in these days? I've managed, I've managed eight different Premier League clubs now, so I've been to eight, eight, eight different different cultures of football club. Yeah. Um, but I've seen a dramatic change, a dramatic change in the the brainwashing of you can only play this way, and uh, this this uh, this continual brainwashing at all angles and all levels of play into the centre half in his own six yard box and playing out from the back is an element that will not benefit football in the long run if everybody has to do it that way. Because the whole experience, as you know, of playing in the Premier League was the amount of different styles, tactics, systems that we played against every week that we would adjust to when we were here because as you know I would say this week we would have to play this way against this yep. team to win and be pragmatic in our approach which the players were very good at but this consistent uh, playing from copy pasting the, the style it, of play yeah his style of play means that if you look at uh, and it does make me laugh. You can see I'm laughing here. If you have a high press inside, who's the best high press inside in Europe, which is Liverpool? Completely agree. Why? Why on earth, if you're a coach, would you pass it to your centre half in his own box? Doesn't make sense. But managers and young coaches, or head coaches today, they're not managers are so scared to try and play a different way because of the criticism that still continue to try and do it. Yeah. And that's really sad because they have their own mind or should be left to have their own mind on how they pick their team to play and how to choose the tactics they need to choose to actually do what you need to do. And that's win football matches. And play to your strengths as and well. And play to your strengths. And of course, you have to entertain. And I think that people entertain, are entertained in, in England by the success in the opposition's box, by the amount of time you enter into the opposition's box, by getting a fan on the edge of the seat by entering the opposition's box. Yeah. And that's really getting lost when you look at the statistics. The, the entries into the penalty area, the shots, the shots on target are, a bit, are beginning to diminish rather than an increase in, in the Premier League. And I think that that's probably a cause of this continuum. Now, if you have the players, absolutely, you play that way. You yeah. know, we changed our style and we got better and better here at Bolton by we never played in the Premier League 
in 2004, 5, 6, like we played in the Premier League in 2001, 2, 3. Because the players got so much better, yeah. with so much more quality, that we played so much more open, attractive football with an element of when we lose the ball, we are all defenders. Yeah, and this is the, the perfect opportunity to continue, uh, with my point of view, uh, taking on board all the valuable information that you give us, is that uh, every coach, every manager or every head coach or you name it, should always play to his uh, team's strengths, not uh, to the, to the uh, modern uh, style of play. Uh, listen, this is just me, Stelios. I have every admiration for a manager that decides that he's only going to play that way. Yeah, if you have the talent there's and managers, the skill. There's managers who do that, and I agree. Yeah. That's what the, you've got to go your own way. There's, you yeah. know, the so, so you, you, and you build you build a team around that as quickly as you possibly can. I de I decided that it was assessment of the players and their their particular strengths. Exactly. Finally, I'd like to, uh, to inform you of uh, what we're doing now as a Legends uh, 2004, the whole team. Uh, we are uh, uh, very, very aware of, of, the, of the problems of uh, the society. We try to help uh, in our way, the football way, with the community as we used to do it here in uh, Bolton Wonders. Uh, together, we were very, very close to the community with uh, charity games, going to schools, visiting humans and uh, helping with uh, our way. We're quite busy and uh, it give us, uh, gives us uh, the purpose. joy, gives us a purpose to pass the information on to the next generations and uh, getting them involved through football, creating uh, better life uh, environments. Excellent. This is what uh, we're trying to do and obviously our interview is a part of that uh, process. At this moment of time, I would like to, to thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart, uh, not only for the interview, and, uh, but uh, for what you have uh, done for me and my family all these years that I was playing for the club. I really have no words to, to thank you for uh, opening the magic door of the, of the English football to me and my family. It's, it's always going to be a very well uh, kept in my, my heart. Mine too. And you know I love you very much. Uh, and Sen, I love you too, man. Thank you very much, Gaffa. I will present you the, your personal shirt. Yeah.